Eight, Project Habakkuk. Project Habakkuk was the brainchild of Jeffrey Pike, a well-known English inventor and journalist. Pike was close personal friends with John Desmond Bernal, the Irish scientist who developed X-ray crystallography. The two men worked together at Combined Operations Headquarters, and based on the work he'd done, Pike was considered a genius by British naval officer Lord Mountbatten. While in the U.S. organizing the production of M29 Weasels, a tracked vehicle designed for the snow, Pike came up with the idea to build a warship out of an iceberg. At the time, resources like aluminum and steel were hard to come by, and when they were available, they were required for more projects. In order to protect Atlantic convoys and seaborne landings that were out of reach of aircraft cover, Pike decided that the answer was ice. He proposed that either an artificial or natural iceberg should be hollowed out to shelter aircraft, and that it could be leveled to provide a runway like those seen on massive aircraft carriers. Once he had the plan, he sent it to Lord Mountbatten. After reading the proposal and considering it, Mountbatten passed the plan on to Sir Winston Churchill, who was enthusiastic about the idea of a warship made of ice. In early 1942, Bernal and Pike recruited Max Ferdinand Perutz to help them determine whether or not an iceberg would be big enough to withstand Atlantic conditions during construction. Perutz came to the conclusion that a natural iceberg would have too small of a surface above the water for an airstrip, and that they were more prone to roll over. If it wasn't for the invention of Pycrete, a mixture of wood pulp and water, the whole project would have been completely abandoned. Pycrete was stronger than regular ice, it had a slower melting rate, and amazingly, it wouldn't sink. So the decision was made to build a large-scale model of the Pycrete warship in Canada at Jasper National Park. Massive ice blocks were created for the project at Alberta's Lake Louise, and a small prototype was put together at Patricia Lake, weighing 1,000 tons and measuring 60 feet by 30 feet. Based on the success of their first model, they expected to have a functional ice warship by 1944. But cold flow had become a serious issue for the group, and it was determined that steel reinforcements were needed, causing the cost estimate to skyrocket. More issues like the problem of controlling and mounting a rudder over 100 feet high were never solved in the end, bringing Project Habakkuk to a halt in December 1943. The Habakkuk design received a hefty amount of criticism after the fact, since the large amount of wood pulp required for the warship was enough to affect paper production and the proof of concept was further criticized in April 2009 when Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman recreated the design on their TV show Mythbusters, only for the Pycrete to start leaking only 20 minutes into their journey around Alaskan waters. This experiment proved that it's probably not a good idea to build a warship out of ice. Number 7. Crazy Woman's Fork the 1865 Powder River Expedition was a massive U.S. military operation against the Sioux, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Arapaho tribes in Dakota and Montana. It's considered a giant failure due to its inability to intimidate Native Americans, despite them being successful in destroying an Arapaho village and establishing Fort Connor. On August 1, 1865, 675 soldiers, civilian teamsters, and Native American scouts led by Brigadier General Patrick E. Connor left Fort Laramie, Dakota Territory to meet Colonel Nelson D. Cole and Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Walker's columns. Connor's group went north, and on the Upper Powder River, Fort Connor was established later that same month. Another military leader, Captain Frank J. North of the Pawnee Scouts, was riding near the Crazy Woman's Fork near Powder River with some of his men on August 13. As soon as they noticed a group of Cheyenne warriors, they started a chase. During the pursuit, North was separated from his men, so the retreating warriors regrouped and made him their sole target. One of the Cheyenne injured North's horse, but unwilling to surrender, the captain used the animal as a barricade. From that position, he successfully fought off attackers until reinforcements arrived. One of the scouts from Fort Connor eventually found North and joined him. Shortly after, several other Pawnees showed up to fight off the Native American warriors, who left after many of them had been shot and wounded. The battle at Crazy Woman's Fork was just one of the many engagements that took place throughout the Powder River Expedition. Number 6. Black Hills Led by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, the U.S. Army's Black Hills Expedition began on July 2, 1874. With orders to travel to the Black Hills of South Dakota, Custer and his team left Bismarck, North Dakota, which at that time was Fort Abraham Lincoln in the Dakota Territory. The mission was to find a route to the Southwest, investigate the prospects of gold mining, and look for locations to build a military fort. On July 22, Custer and his unit arrived in the Black Hills, with orders to return by August 30th. 
Following orders, the expedition team organized a campsite where the town of Custer was later built. At the same time, Colonel Custer and his military units looked for somewhere to build a fort, while civilians searched for gold. It's not exactly clear if a significant amount of the resource was ever found, but nonetheless, a gold rush ensued, in turn antagonizing the Sioux Native Americans who'd been promised that their sacred land would be protected. They signed a treaty proposed by the U.S. government, so when it wasn't upheld, they fought back to defend their land. As a result, Custer was killed by the Sioux during the Battle of Little Bighorn, which was a smaller battle amidst the Great Sioux War of 1876 and 1877 between the natives and the U.S. Number 5. Camp Century History can sometimes be much stranger than science fiction. For example, the United States used to have an underground city called Camp Century in the North Pole. In all honesty, it looked like the rebel base on the planet Hoth from Star Wars. Camp Century was established back in 1959. It was originally used as a scientific post hundreds of feet beneath an iceberg in Greenland. From above, it resembled a mysterious pyramid covered in snow. But below the surface, it was ginormous. At one point, the base had a staff of 200 employees, and the facility was powered by a nuclear reactor. It was a bona fide underground city, complete with a chapel, a gym, shops, a library, and a movie theater. But as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end. And soon after being built, the base was snatched from science and started being used by the U.S. military. The military used Camp Century to test out their new weaponry. The base was also once a preliminary camp for the infamous Project Iceworm, whose goal was to create a network of nuclear missile launch sites that would be able to withstand a strike. Thankfully, the project was canceled in 1966 due to unstable ice conditions. This is all according to declassified documents released in 1996. The camp functioned until 1967, when Greenland's shifting ice caps made habitation at the base impossible. As a result, Camp Century was abandoned, and the underground city was eventually crushed under the weight of snow. Have you ever heard of this expedition? Let us know in the comments, and subscribe if you're enjoying the video! Number 4. Alexandria Expedition of 1807 The 1807 Alexandria Expedition, sometimes referred to as the Fraser Expedition, was an attempt by the British to capture the Egyptian city of Alexandria during the Anglo-Turkish War. And when we say it was an attempt, it's because the mission was a complete failure. It was launched to gain a base of operations against the French and Ottoman empires in the Mediterranean Sea. It was all part of a larger strategy against the Ottoman-French alliance of Selim III, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire between 1789 and 1807. Even though Alexandria was briefly occupied and captured, later attempts to proceed inland were rebuffed, resulting in the British forces being defeated twice in battles at Rashid, the port city of the Nile. These defeats caused the deaths of over 900 officers and soldiers, many of whom were taken prisoner. The captured British troops were marched to Cairo like cattle between rows of stakes where hundreds of severed heads belonging to their slain comrades were showcased. Those that weren't killed were either sold into slavery or condemned to hard labor. The leftover British forces were forced to retreat to Alexandria, where they stayed since they were unable to gather supplies. Then, Viceroy Muhammad Ali, the Ottoman Albanian governor at the time and de facto ruler of Egypt, used the British prisoners and the deserted army as a bargaining tool. In the end, his tactic worked, and British commanders were forced to halt any further operations in Egypt. Again, the British were forced to embark their transports and leave the country, having not accomplished anything they set out to do. In reality, all the expedition did was help unify the people behind Muhammad Ali and convince the British government to fully support Egypt, staying with the Ottoman Empire. Number 3 the China Relief Expedition. In order to rescue European nationals, U.S. citizens, and others during the later years of the Boxer Rebellion, an anti-Christian uprising, the China Relief Expedition was undertaken by the United States Armed Forces in China between 1898 and 1901. It was part of a multinational military effort called the Eight Nation Alliance. The U.S. contributed many troops to the effort to relieve the foreign legations in Beijing and to besiege the Boxer militia who wanted to remove foreign imperialism inside the country. But toward the end of the expedition, the U.S. military's focus changed from rescuing foreign and U.S. nationals to suppressing rebellions. And by 1902, the Boxer militia had been effectively controlled in the capital of the People's Republic of China. 
Number 2. Russia's Discovery of Siberia At the end of the 16th century, Siberia entered Russian history fairly late. The official Russian expedition into the frozen wasteland we now call Siberia started in 1581, when Yermak Timofeyevich led a scouting team across the Ural Mountains, later defeating the forces of the Khanat of Sibir, the indigenous Turkish-speaking people that inhabited the steppes and forests of western Siberia. The paths of the Slavic warriors could have reached Siberia earlier, but as Russian settlements expanded close to the land beyond the Ural Mountains, exploration into the uncharted territory became more and more essential to securing Russia's eastward expansion. Tsar Ivan the Terrible provided the catalyst for Russia to extend its borders. He pursued the Golden Horde's remaining members across Eurasia, which simply means he sought control of the land under the rule of a Khan. In 1551, Ivan sacked Kazan, and he did the same thing in 1557 to Astrakhan. But the rest of the region in the western part of Siberia was still being controlled by the heirs of Genghis Khan. The wide territory from the middle of the Ural Mountains to the Ob River was held by Khan Kachum. So in a three-day battle, Yermak Timofeyevich's troops defeated Kachum's army in October 1582. And it was this victory that essentially opened the gates to the rest of Siberia for Russia. Number 1. Polar Bear Expedition The U.S. Army's 85th Division, which was mostly made up of men from Wisconsin and Michigan, finished its training during the summer of 1918 at Fort Custer and then went overseas to England. While some of the division was getting ready to enter the fighting in France, about 5,000 troops from the 339th Infantry and Support Units were given Russian equipment and weapons before setting sail for Archangel in Russia, situated about 600 miles from Moscow. In early September, when U.S. troops reached their destination, they met up with an international force commanded by the British, who'd been sent to northern Russia for reasons that oddly were never made known. Whatever the purpose of the intervention was, the force was seeking a fight with the Bolsheviks, who'd taken control of Moscow and Petrograd the previous winter. Fighting happened from 1918 to 1919, and was concentrated in six areas scattered across Archangel Province in a sort of semicircle. The American troops struggled with morale during these battles, wondering why they were still participating in combat when the war with Germany had already wrapped up. But in April of 1919, a new American commander arrived in Archangel with orders for his men to withdraw from the country. And a few months later, British troops withdrew as well. But the anti-Bolshevik government they'd left behind held control of the city for years until February 1920. Veterans of the campaign in Detroit held their first official reunion in 1922, which is when they formed the Polar Bear Association with the goal to perpetuate the memory of their Russian expedition. And this is how the campaign earned its name, the Polar Bear Expedition. If you were in the military and you were told to go on a secret expedition to explore mysterious ancient tunnels beneath the US, would you be able to keep it under wraps? Or would you have to tell someone about it? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye!